I want to speak to you today about the necessity of being radical with sin. Now, in certain circles of Christianity, this is not at all a popular teaching. In fact, it's rejected at times. And yet this is one of the clearest teachings in all of the Bible. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, if you want to go ahead and turn there. But in certain, in certain circles of Christianity, it's not foreign to hear whether in songs that you may listen to, Christian songs, so-called, or to hear sermons at times, or simply to run into people who think this way. No doubt many of you watching right now have ran into people who think along these lines. And they think something like this, no matter what sins we commit, no matter what we do in life, no matter which direction we go in life, nothing can take me out of God's hand. Nothing can do that. And what I want to say to you this morning is that the Bible never uses that type of language. The Bible never. And if you disagree with me, I would be glad to hear from you. But the Bible never says things like this. The sins you are committing really don't matter. Or the Bible never says no matter what you do, which way you go, how many sins you commit, you can never be taken out of the grace of God. And what you find often in, in people who are using this type of language and this type of thinking is that they are abusing a great passage like Romans chapter 8 that speaks about our security as believers. Now, whether you're watching and you're your theological persuasion is that of a Calvinist or an Arminian or a Lutheran or a Wesleyan or any other theological system, we all should be able as biblical Christians to agree that the Bible never speaks along these lines. The Bible never says no matter how you live, what you do, you're still going to be saved. It does not speak like that. And yet the Bible very clearly tells us that we must be radical with our sins. We must not be happy or restful as long as there are, is sin coming at us in our hearts, in our life, that we will not deal with. No, the Bible says we must deal with these sins. And what I want us to see today is, for, again, from Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 29 and also 30, but especially verse 29. This verse is in the Sermon on the Mount, one of, if not the most famous teachings of our Lord. Chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew are known as the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus gives this great message and touches on so many different things. And one thing that we see in the Sermon on the Mount is what is true Christianity? What does it really mean to be a true Christian? Now you may be watching, you say to yourself, you know, Clint, isn't everyone who confesses to be a Christian, aren't they a Christian? And if you look in chapter 7 of Matthew, verses 21 through 23, you'll see very clearly that at, at the end, the Bible says, many will say unto me, Jesus says, Lord, Lord, but he'll say to them, I never knew you. So no, everyone who confesses to be a Christian is not a Christian. In fact, the majority of professing Christians in America, I really have no doubt about this, are not true Christians. How many people do we know today who claim to be Christians and yet they constantly, deliberately, and continually disobey God and his will for them? Well, let's look at this today. Matthew chapter 5, let's read verse 29 and 30 together. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. 
Now you may, you, you may be watching and you're surprised that Jesus spoke like that. And what I would encourage you to do is to read the Gospels. Read what Jesus actually said. Do not rely upon what you think He said. Do not rely upon what somebody once told you that He said or didn't say. Go to the Bible for yourself and read the words of Jesus. But what we see here in verse 29 and 30 very clearly is that as Christians we are called upon to deal with sin seriously. We cannot be light and frivolous with sin. No, as Christians, we are called to fight against sin and put it to death. And the same grace of God that saves us is the same grace of God that enables us to now fight for and against, for the Lord and against sin. And I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Well, look with me in verse 29. First thing I want you to see is this. In our calling as Christians to fight against sin, we must understand that some of the sins and some of the things that we must fight against and get out of our life can be good things. I know that may sound strange to you, But some of the things in your life right now, perhaps, that are causing you to sin are not evil things in and of themselves, but they are good, even wholesome things that are causing you to sin. Well, look in verse 29 again. If your right eye makes you stumble. Now, what is your right eye? Your right eye is a gift of God. Verse 30 says, if your right hand makes you stumble. These are not only good things, these are gifts of God. God has given us our eyes. God has given us our hands. God has blessed us with this. And if you who are watching still have that ability to use your eye and your hand, praise God for that. What a gift of grace that is to us, common grace given to us as people to be able to see, to be able to use our hands, to be able to function in that way. That is a marvelous gift that God has given us. And yet, what we see in this passage is this gift can be used for evil, for sin. Let me name a few things to us today. Your phone. Your phone can be a very good thing. It can be used in a very bad way. Is your phone something that can be good Is it causing you to sin? What about sports? I know for the most part, sports are out of the picture right now because of the coronavirus. And yet, do sports at times cause you to sin? What about friends in your life? Do you have a friend in your life or a family member that leads you down the wrong path? What about work? Does your work lead you down and cause you to stumble, whether because of the the people you are with perhaps, whether because of the type of work it is or something that is there, something about work or your co-workers leads you into stumbling into sin. What about social media? What about your own dreams and aspirations? What about the hobbies that you have? All these things though they may be good in and of themselves, if used rightly, all these things can lead us into sin and to stumble and to fall. And I would ask you, are these things in your life and other things in your life causing you to sin, leading you down a road you shouldn't go, causing your mind to drift, causing your hands to go and to, to do things they ought not to do, causing your feet to walk and go to places they ought not to go? Are these things that may or may not be bad in and of themselves, are they leading you down the wrong road? I played a lot of athletics growing up. And just take, uh, maybe you're a big basketball player or a football player. And maybe you love to watch it. Sports can be a blessing. Sports can be a good thing. However, however, does that good thing grab your heart 
and won't let it go. And maybe for days on end, after you play that sport or watch your favorite team, maybe for days on end, your heart is restless. It's wanting more and more and more, forgetting about God. It wants, it wants to ha- harbor bitterness even because your team lost. Listen, other people may able, be able to watch and play sports for the glory of God, but maybe you're not one of those people. Maybe for you, when you play sports, it just takes over, becomes an idol. It grabs your heart. Well, these are things we have to ask ourselves. Is this gift of God, is this good thing leading me into sin? Well, if it is, we have to get rid of it. You say, what what are you talking about? I've got to have my phone. Well, do you have to have your phone or do you have to have your soul saved? You say, well, I've got to have my work. I've got to have my friends. I've got to have this. Well, which will it be? Your soul saved or you, at least for a season, putting these things away until you can use them responsibly and rightly. So what we see here is sometimes the things that we have to do away with, the things that we have to reject, sometimes they're good things. Or at least they're not bad in and of themselves. I want you to see this nextly. Next, I want you to see that we have to take drastic measure, drastic measures to get rid of the things in our life that are wrong, that are sinful. Jesus says, if your right eye makes you stumble, what are you supposed to do? Tear it out. And throw it from you. In one sense, we are to treat sin like a grenade. We have a grenade. The pin is pulled. Get that thing away from us as far as we can and as, and as quick as we can. Throw that thing away from us. That's what sin is. Jesus says, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Throw it away from you. If your hand offends you, cut it off and throw it away from you. Now, I do not believe he's talking about literally taking your eye out, literally cutting your hand off. But I think we get the picture. The things in our life that cause us to sin, let us be done with them. Let us pick them up and throw them as far as we can away from us. They are more dangerous to us than a rattlesnake. They are more dangerous to us than a grenade. A rattlesnake may lead to your death, but sin will lead to the death of your soul. Jesus says, if you have sin in your life, the thing that's causing you to sin, do whatever you can to get rid of it, even if it's drastic measures. We must do these things. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke 13. He says, strive, strive to enter through the narrow door. We have to strive to get in the narrow door. Whatever it takes, get in the narrow door. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Jesus says there's going to be many people who seek to come into heaven at the end of their life. Many people are going to try to seek to come in. And he says, no. Few are going to find this door. Therefore, you need to strive, strive to enter in. Push, do whatever it takes. Struggle, wrestle, fight, strive to enter in to the narrow door. Many are on the road to destruction, the Bible teaches. Few will find life, friend. On down in this passage, it says this, Then you begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. This is after they are told by the Lord Jesus, I don't know you. 
And listen to what he says next. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. An evildoer. See, it doesn't matter what you profess. You may be, you may profess to be a Christian. You've been baptized. You belong to a church. You've got a Bible at home. You give to charities. It doesn't matter if we, we have sin in our life and we love that sin. We continue in that sin and we won't repent of that sin. It does not matter what comes out of our mouth. If we have sin in our life, we must be done with that. We must put it away, put that thing that's causing us to stumble away from us and be done with it. My friend. We'll look back in Matthew 5. This strong language, tear it out. Throw it from you, cut it off, throw it away from you. That's sin, that's sin. Get rid of it. Now this is, this is hard language. And yet this is the best thing for you. This is the best thing for you. Look what Jesus says next. For it is better for you. One thing that I really want you to understand and to get from this message is that the commands of God are good. The commands of God are good. Whatever God tells you to do, He tells you to do that because He loves you. It's the best thing for you. It's the best thing. You know, before all the coronavirus and things happened in our country, and so many things were shut down, one of the big issues, it's still a huge issue, it's just been overshadowed for a while, was sexuality. People doing and being whatever they want to be. Homosexuality, um, men trying to be women, women trying to become men. Just this autonomous sexuality. We can be and do whatever we want. Well, as difficult and as maybe even strange, it's not strange, but it may seem strange to you. The teaching of the Bible and sexuality is good for you. It's the best thing for you. I mean, if there is a God in heaven, and and there is, surely His will, His good will is going to conflict with our will at times. And we're going to have to submit to His will, not our will. We are the creature. He is the creator. And whatever God commands us in this life, we may not fully understand everything for the reasons why He commands it, but that does not give us a a good reason not to obey it. The commands of God are good. They're right. They're wholesome. They're the best thing for you. And that's what Jesus is saying to us. For it is better for you to lose, listen to this, to lose one of the parts of your body. You say, no, wait a minute. It's better for me to lose my hand? It's better for me to lose my eye? What are we talking about? Look what he says. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. It is better for... Now listen, that's just, this is just clearly true. Giving these two choices, which is better? For your whole body to go to hell and judgment or for you to lose a few parts of your body? Well, obviously, you would rather be saved and yet lack a few parts of your body than to go to hell with all your members intact. And that's what Jesus is looking at. You remember the man some time ago in Utah that got his arm stuck somehow uh, in rocks, I believe. And this man had to literally cut his arm off. Did he want to do that? Of course not. Did he want to save his life? Yes. And it was worth cutting his arm off to save his life. And here, Jesus is teaching us, these few pleasures, 
that you think you're enjoying. You may be, and no doubt people do enjoy sin for a season. These few pleasures you may have for a while, it is better for you to cut these pleasures off, to forget about them, to get rid of even the good things in your life that's harming you so that you can go to heaven. Then go to hell with all your pleasure with you. It's like one man once said, He said, it's better to limp to heaven than dance to hell. It's better to limp your way to heaven, friend, than dance your way to hell. I'd rather live 70 or 80 years or so of this life struggling with sin and have heaven at the end of my days than to live my life up to do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, and to enjoy the pleasures of this world and die after 70 or 80 years and go to hell forever. There's a lot of people dancing today. There's not near as many people limping. But let me tell you this, I want to be, spiritually speaking, somebody who is limping, somebody who is striving, somebody who is fighting, Somebody who is going to get through by the grace of God and live holy for Christ Jesus in this world. Sin is a very serious thing. The acceptance of sin is the rejection of God. If we accept sin and go after it, it's our master. And Jesus said you cannot love and serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will despise the one and love the other. No, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and anything else. God is number one in our lives. And He is the only one, the only God that we have. Friends, you can, you can go look at this verse yourself. Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 through 30. It's spoken in the context of adultery. Jesus says, whatever you do, keep yourself away from adultery, sexual sin, and any other kind of sin as well. Pluck your eye out. Cut your hand off. Get rid of the sin in your life because that sin will lead you to hell. You say, Brother Clint, will sin really lead me to hell? I hear some people saying that it won't. And I've heard people say stuff like that as well, and I, though I'm not altogether certain of what nuance they mean by that. I can tell you this, just clearly from the Bible, I think the best answer you can give is yes. Friend, I mean, what are we looking at here? Are, are we kidding? Sin will lead us to hell. Sin shows that we have not a relationship with God. Sin shows that our heart is against God. Friend, Let me say this before I close today. You may say, Brother Clint, do you believe, do you believe that we're saved by grace or do we have to work our way to heaven like this? And what I would say is this, this most certainly is not a work that we're talking about. Now it is work, but it's not working our way to heaven. If, if you haven't watched it or if you want to, a few weeks ago I preached about Jesus' resurrection and our justification. How we are justified by faith. I believe in the grace of God. That's how we're saved. I believe in justification by faith. Without grace and justification by faith, we would not be saved. So why am I saved today? I'm saved because of the grace of God that God has graciously given me a gift in Christ Jesus of righteousness by faith in Him. But here's something, and this is, we have all these conflicts in Christianity today. We have one side teaching this, one side teaching that, and both sides at times are saying good things, and sometimes at least what we need to do is put these things closer together. And that's what we need to do with this. What I'm saying today does not contradict the grace of God. It does not contradict salvation by faith. But what I'm saying today complements it and, and shows the other side or another side of grace. 
The same grace of God that saves a man and a woman and a boy and a girl is the same grace of God that teaches that same person to live godly in Christ Jesus. Listen, if you're saved by grace, know this, you have a fight within you. You have fight within you. You are a fighter if you are saved. And if you are not a fighter, you're not saved. Or you will not continue with the Lord. The same grace of God that saves us and comforts our heart is that same grace of God that gives us strength to fight against the devil and sin. And the very fact, the, the proof, one of the proofs that we have received the grace of God is that I now fight against the devil. I fight against sin. I was once a dead fish flowing with the stream, but now I'm alive and I'm going against that stream. I once, I once walked with the world. I once did worldly things. I once enjoyed sinful company and sinful things. I once enjoyed all these things, but now God has saved me. He has given me His grace. And now I fight against these things because I have a new nature within me. So friend, you're saved by grace. You're saved by faith in Christ. Yes. But if you are saved, you will fight against sin and try to continually grow more and more and more in holiness without which no man will see the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12. So friends, we must fight against sin and put it to death in our life. And that is one of the proofs of our Christianity. If you have a comment or a question about this message, I'd love to hear from you. Double branch, let's please remember each other in prayer. Remember our church family in prayer. And... Uh, Sometime in the future, I'll be saying more about coming back and meeting together. May the Lord bless you today. May the Lord use His Word in our life and help us. Amen.